All right. Okay, welcome everybody to this Tile Network um, talk on transitions into and through higher education, duck to water or fish out of water by Dr. Julie Hume. I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Julie um, Hume today. She's a reader in psychology at um, Keeley University uh, in the UK, a national teaching fellow and principal fellow of the Higher Education Academy. She applies psychology to learning, teaching, assessment, and inclusion in higher education. Julie's own experiences as a mature student helped her to recognize the importance of transition to university and of skills and confidence for successful university study. She strives to create engaging learning opportunities which help all students to achieve their aspirations. Julie teaches, um, Julie's teaching em emphasizes um, the application of psychology to everyday life, facilitating students to apply psychology to their personal and professional goals. Okay, um, I will hand over to you. I will stop sharing my screen now. And uh, if you want to tweet during this talk, you can use the hashtag Tile Network on Twitter. All right. Thank you so much, Carolina, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, I'm very excited to be here at the Tile Network. Um, I've been looking forward to it for, for weeks, um, and I have a bit of a soft spot for Glasgow, um, having spent quite a bit of time with colleagues at Glasgow University in the past, so uh, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, as Carolina says, today I'm going to be talking about transitions. Um, I've been researching transitions as a topic for probably 10 years or so now, um, thinking about it obviously as an educator for, for much longer than that. I've been teaching since around, oh gosh, 1996. Um, and very early in my career, I realized that students came to university with different expectations and different ways of thinking about what they were going to be doing at uni and what uni was for. Um, and my job really early back then was thinking about how to help students to be successful. So I was thinking particularly about student skills at the time. And my thinking's really evolved since then. So I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a journey through how I've thought about transitions by looking at three different publications that I've produced over the years, ending with this most recent one with Naomi Winston from Surrey University um, about ducks to water and fish out of water. Um, so, Today I'm going to be thinking about how we construct this idea of transition and whether we tend to problematize it for our students and whether that's okay or whether that's problematic. So I'm not going to promise to have all the answers, but I'm hoping that by talking through some of my research and some of my thinking about this, that you'll, um, you'll have some ideas too and that at the end we'll be able to have some discussion about the practical implications of this and, and how we can sort of work better to create a good transitional experience for students coming into university. I'm just checking actually that you can see my slides. I take it everybody has, has got that okay. Yeah, okay, good. So I'm going to start today by thinking about the literature um, into transition. So back in 2013, I published a paper with Helen Kitching where we just reviewed the literature on transitions um, and really sort of summarised particularly what the issues were in psychology. Um, I then did some work when I used to work for the Higher Education Academy. Um, we did a massive project on transitions in STEM subjects, so science, technology, engineering and maths. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how I was thinking then and then move on to this third project, the Ducks and Fish project, as it's become affectionately known with Naomi. Um, and then we'll think about some practical steps to help students to be ducks to water, to have um, a successful and smooth transitional experience and what that actually means. It might not be a problem free transition when we talk about being a duck to water and we'll have some discussion and questions. So I want you to, to just start out by having a little think about your own transition to university. What happened? How did it feel? What were you thinking as you started? What did you do to try and help yourself with transition? 
while you're thinking about that, I'll tell you a little bit about my own transition. Um, and then I might ask for just one or two people to sort of share some, some ideas from their experience. So I came to university as a first in family student. I was um, a working class student. My dad was an electrician. My mum was a childminder. Nobody else in the family had been to uni. Um, and I was a single mom. So I was slightly mature. I wasn't a proper mature student. I was 21, but felt mature. Felt a lot older than the, the students who were coming traditionally through from A-levels and into university that way. And I was really not convinced that I was going to fit in. So I'd got this idea that university was going to be all highfalutin and everybody was going to be posh and everybody was going to be rich and everybody was going to be loads cleverer than me and younger than me and have less complicated lives than me. And I wasn't totally convinced that I was going to make it. Um, and I didn't know anything about university at all. So I turned up on my first day and I had no idea. What do you wear on your first day at uni? Not a clue. OK, so it's going to be these rich, posh people. I'm going to wear a shirt, a skirt, court shoes with little heels. I'm going to be smart and presentable as if I was going to work. That, that must be what you do. I turned up on the first day and it's Keel, so like Glasgow, it rains a lot. It was grey, um, lots of rain, wet ground, and there's a lot of slippy tarmac at Keel. And court shoes with heels probably aren't the best thing for walking on slippy tarmac in the rain. And I fell flat on my face. That was my first day at uni. I was really scared. I was really worried I wasn't going to fit in. And then as time went by, I had to cope with... How do you juggle childcare and university? How do you cope with finance when you've got a house and a child? All sorts of things. It took me probably the first two years of my four year degree to realize that actually I could do this and I could succeed. And so from there, I was quite kind of passionate about making sure that other people could have this experience and, and moving on through my career. That's been one of my focuses is to make sure that everybody can feel like they belong at university. Does anybody have any contrasting stories that you're willing to share with me? I'm going to put you on the spot just a little. Don't worry if you can't. Anybody willing to speak? I will speak Please. just because <laughs> the silence makes me so <laughs> um, I missed my freshers week because uh, my friend's dad had died so I stayed home for an extra week so I turned up not having a clue uh, about like I, I'd missed whatever induction there was and I vividly remember my very very first psychology lecture um, which was the most stereotypical academic you've ever seen tweed suit old guy elbow patches it was on classical conditioning which is something I now teach and love teaching um and I sat there and I think I went home and cried and I was like I don't belong here like because it was it was he was one of those teachers where you know why use a five letter word when a 20 letter one will do um and I'm also from a working class background and and stuff and I just felt uh, yeah I, I think I cried quite a lot in the first few weeks of just like um, I went to Edinburgh, so there was a lot of privately educated people there and stuff. And it, it, it was it was a really difficult transition, especially coming from having been top of the class at school to not no longer being top of the class. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think kind of similar, but in a very different way. Just, I, yeah, I was 19 and, and it just, yeah, but the, the, the tears were, were quite real, I think. <laughs> Absolutely. So I think for, for you and I, Emily, we both had sort of fish out of water experiences where we were suddenly somewhere quite strange in a different world where you don't know the rules and you don't feel like you quite fit in. Everybody's a bit different and you don't know where, where your place is in that world. Did anybody have a really good transition experience? Did anybody feel really comfortable with starting uni? Anybody brave enough to own up? Oh, uh, hi. <laughs> I guess I'll say oh, something. Hello, Gabriella. <laughs> um, so this is basically my first year of university. And obviously, as you know, COVID-19 happened. And so it all started online and it's still going mm -hmm. on online. And the cool thing is that um, the last two years of my school career, I basically 
uh, was attending an online school. So starting university online was something that was actually quite cool to me. And I think what's really nice about this experience is that everyone is just as confused as I am because we're all starting this experience online. There's a lot of first years. And I think the one thing that we have in common, if anything, is the fact that we're all going through this experience for the first time and it's all online. So I think that's been pretty cool for me. But um, it is overwhelming though, I will say. But I think it's an experience that I'm very excited to see um, how it goes and just kind of hearing you guys' stories and how it ended up turning out for you guys. I'm very excited. That sounds fantastic and good luck with it. It sounds like you're having a, a wonderful experience and I bet there's a lot of people who are quite jealous of your experience of having done on, online education before. Um, I certainly am. So I think um, when we talk about transition, we, we mean lots of different things. And we tend to think about a change. So uprooting from the life we had before to, to moving to a university life. Um, we might see it as a, a sudden change or we might see it as a journey. Um, and often when you look at the literature, transition is framed as a challenge. So the literature about transitions talks a lot about a shift in identity, becoming a student. Um, and, and how is that different from being a higher student or an A-level student or a mature um, employed person living independently who then goes to university. So there's a shift in identity that we have to navigate uh, when we start university. Um, there's a lot of talk about social support. So when you look at the, the university policies around transition and the guidance that they give, it's often about you know, making friends, um, talking to your personal tutor, talking to your academic tutors, finding ways of getting support, whether that's formal or informal. Um, lots of universities have, for example, uh, mentoring schemes that help you to, to find social support when you start uni. Um, there's lots of, of discussion of independent living as a challenge. So you're going to leave home. You're going to have to cook for yourself for the first time. You're going to have to do your laundry. Maybe you go back and visit your parents to get some of those things done. So you bring back a casserole and get your laundry done while you're there. Um, you're going to have to manage your own finances. You're going to have to take responsibility over alcohol and drugs. Um, and then there's um, sort of challenges that are framed around the learning and teaching environment. So you're used to being taught in a classroom of 30 students and now there might be 350 psychology students or however many there are at your uni, um, you're gonna be an independent learner, whatever that means, you're going to be it. There are these weird things called seminars. I had no idea what a seminar was before I started uni. Um, I was just told I had to turn up for them. What do you do for them? What are they? I have no idea. What's one of those? Assessments are going to be different. So, you know, um, you can't submit a draft, which you can if you're doing an A-level. You can hand in a draft and, and then rework it and improve it. Your teacher's there to help you to improve on assessment. And early on, I think one of the things that I thought a lot about was the expectation versus reality gap. So talking to students and they'd say, you know, um, for example, I had a PhD student who did some focus groups with students moving from sixth forms in England through to um, universities and he held some focus groups with them while they were in their sixth forms and he said what do you think is going to be different at uni and one of the things that most of them said was there's going to be more independent study I'm going to have to do more independent learning and he said how do you feel about that and the general consensus was our teachers have told us all about it. We're prepared for it. We know how to do that. That's not scary. Six weeks after they started uni, he emailed them and he said, what surprised you about university and how have you dealt with it? And they nearly all responded with independent study is the surprising thing. And John emailed and said, you know, they all told me they were expecting this. What's going on? So we asked them and they said, well, at school, when we talk about independent study, independent study is turn to page 21 of the textbook, read chapter four before the next lesson. At uni, independent study is go read something. They didn't know what they were supposed to be reading, how much they were supposed to be reading, how long they were supposed to be reading for. 
So there was this real gap in expectations between what they thought they were prepared for and what they were really going to be doing. Things like writing long essays and things like that, all very different from what they'd experienced before. So the literature presents this kind of having to adapt, having to change to something that's quite difficult and quite challenging. Um, Gail and Parker in 2014 talk about these taken for granted notions of transition. So we assume that that's what transition is. It's about learning how the university works, how teaching works um, and how to cope with these new challenges. Um, but it, they say the normative and universal discourses of transition do not capture the diversity of student lives, their experiences of universities or of universities themselves. So when we talk about making a transition to university, we fail to take into account the individual nature of our students, what they experience when they get to university and the fact that the universities themselves are not homogeneous. So if we're preparing a higher student to go to uni and different unis have different ways of, of working and different operational cultures, then what are we preparing them for? A lot of the research on transitions has focused on developing students' resilience, their adaptability, their grit, their ability to self-manage. And the idea is that students will come to university, they'll find it hard, but we'll somehow toughen them up, we'll make them better able to cope. And I, I'm kind of beginning to be more and more suspicious of this because actually, it's a little bit like talking about students as snowflakes. So there is this discourse around young people today. You know, your your um, tweed suited lecturer, Emily, might well have, have um, dismissed young people as being snowflakes. They just don't cope. Things get tough and they just melt and disappear. Well, I would argue that snowflakes melt when it's warm. If it's lovely, cold, Arctic conditions, outside, then your snowflakes will be absolutely fine. And so one of the things that I've started to do in my thinking around transitions is not to think about it as a deficit model, that these are the students who are not well prepared for university. These are the students who can't cope with difficulty, but instead to think about the environment. Snowflakes melt when it's warm. Students withdraw from university when we present them with stresses and pressures that might be unreasonable for them to cope with. So we need to think about the environment that the individual is in. What is the university doing that's causing stress? What is it that makes the student need to be resilient and adaptable and gritty and able to self-manage? And how are we addressing the environmental issues as well as the issues that the students themselves might bring? So I'm not dismissing the individual within this. I think we do need to work with students to help them to make good transitions. But we also need to think about the environment that we're transitioning, transiting, moving them into. And this is really drawing on Bronfenbrenner's ecological systems theory, which is a developmental psychology theory. The idea that as an individual, we are situated in a social context. Immediately around us is a microsystem, the family that, that brings us up, maybe um, the neighborhood in which we live, our school, our university, particularly our, our sort of year group and, and immediate tutors at university. Around that, we have a meso system and a macro system, which takes us all the way out to government policy, um, international contexts of higher education, um, you know, the, the kind of current debate around A-level um, and hires and um, international baccalaureates and how students are gonna be assessed to come to university in the absence of exams is setting up part of the environment in which students are existing and in which they're coming to university. And the whole of the discourse of that in the media and things is a wider cultural issue that will impact on our students' experience. So students, themselves are coming from particular family backgrounds. Both Emily and I referred to our, our family backgrounds in talking about our transition to university. Um, they've come from a, a primary school, a high school, and into a university that has its own culture, but they're also affected by what Boris Johnson and all those other people 
um, Nicola Sturgeon um, are deciding about how university works and all of that will impact upon them. So how can we sort of conceptualize transition then, bearing all of this in mind? Well, at the HGA, I worked with Janet de Wilder, who is now at Queen Mary University of London. And we looked at um, a whole range of STEM disciplines, so science, technology, engineering, and maths. Um, we gathered together 381 participants across a series of workshops. So these were run as a kind of big conversation. We invited lecturers from universities in a particular subject, so a maths group or a um, biosciences group, psychology. Um, so lecturers from universities, teachers from sixth forms and colleges, um, and we did do some of these in Scotland as well. Um, students from university, students from schools and colleges, um, others came as well, so people from exam boards, people from publishers, all sorts of people. Um, and we ran a, a big conversation where we talked about transition, what's problematic about transition, what works well, what can we do to make transition better, to tackle this problem of transition. And then I did a thematic analysis on the, um, the conversation, so I captured, the, I recorded the discussions at each table and captured the views that had been expressed. One of the key findings was really um, around this idea, which I hadn't sort of come up with at the time, but this idea that students entering university are fish out of water. They come unprepared for university was a common discourse within the, the data. So in particular, teachers and university lecturers talked about skills and knowledge gaps. So they said things like, you know, students coming to uni just haven't learned about critical thinking. Uh, what they've done is they've wrote, learned a set of facts, they can regurgitate them in an exam, and they think that that's good learning. And when they get to uni, they don't know how to do that. And we want them to write critical essays and to do literature searching and things like that. And we do skills workshops. I don't know why it takes them so long to learn. So there's a real sort of deficit there. The students don't have what it takes. They're poorly prepared. And part of this, according to uni teachers, is about poor teaching and poor um, curricula pre-university. So there was a real kind of blame the teachers. The teachers tended to respond to this actually and say, well, actually our students are really, really good. And then when they get to you, they're struggling. So what are you doing to break our students? And they also talked about the fact that they would struggle with students coming from the previous level. So if they were teaching A level, they struggled with GCSE students because they didn't have the skills and the, the knowledge that was needed to do an A level. The GCSE teachers said, well, they come to us from primary school really struggling. So there was a real kind of, you know, ultimately, we're going to have to take it back and blame the midwife discussion happening here that, you know, whose fault is it that these students are arriving poorly prepared for university. So that was quite a problematic um, theme from the data. There was also um, a discussion around the fact that students weren't given sufficient signposting to know what to expect. So they had these preformed expectations, um, which may have come from their school teachers or may have come from their peers or their family members who've been to uni. Um, but there wasn't really explicit information. So when a student starts at university, who tells them what a seminar is? Who gives them information about what to expect? Who tells them how independent study works? Um, and I actually know a university now that's that's got a chat group that opens before the term starts where they talk about what what do students wear so that fear can be dealt with before people arrive so the need to kind of make the unknown known to tell students about university and what to expect when they get there students themselves talked a lot about anonymity feeling that they were lost in a crowd that class sizes of you know, 100 plus could feel really overwhelming. And they were used to being in a group of 25 or 30 maximum. This was really quite hard for them. They felt like nobody knew them. They were nameless, faceless, part of an amorphous blob in the classroom. 
there was a lot of tension between the different sectors. So schools and college teachers and university teachers really sort of not understanding what the world was like in the other sector, what the different pressures were on those who were teaching. Um, and, and they weren't really sort of sharing and cooperating to support the transition. And that was one of the things that really came out of the data was a wish to do that, to share resources um, for uni teachers to go and see what life's like in a sixth form um, and for sixth form teachers to be able to access research that was happening in the university. And students themselves were really keen to engage with this. They wanted to be able to go back to their old schools and say, I went to uni, this is what it was like. Um, and, and to sort of peer mentor and things like that. So a real kind of willingness from the students. The students were the ones who didn't have any kind of political agenda. They just wanted to get involved and help people to make this transition. Subsequent to that project, I wrote a, a short paper with Andy Holliman and Kevin Wilson-Smith from the Division of Academics, Researchers and Teachers in Psychology at the BPS DARP. And it was a series of short reflections. So Andy is um, a researcher into adaptability. So he was looking at how can we encourage students and develop students to help them to be more adaptable so that when they meet changes and challenges when they start university, they're ready for that and they know how to manage themselves through it and they can cope better with the stresses and strains. Um, Andy's work really suggests that we can develop this adaptability, which is closely related to, but not quite the same as resilience or grit. Um, and the more adaptable students are, if you measure adaptability, the more engaged they are when they start uni and the more likely they are to succeed. So there's a correlation between adaptability scores and academic achievement. And this kind of frames this idea of transitions as a challenging time in a novel environment, which you can adapt to. So it's, it's the responsibilities on the student there to be adaptable, but also a little bit on the university to help them to become adaptable. I wrote about my work at, at, the, um, at the HEA with the STEM work about the idea that you must be prepared. So you need this signposting, you need your teachers and local university departments and people like that to, to prepare you, to tell you what to expect, to close that expectation reality gap by moving expectations. But then following on from that, um, Charlotte Taylor, also from DARP, provided us with a short autoethnographic account of her transition between being a postgraduate student and being an early career researcher, and really emphasized in that the importance of social support so starting to bring in this idea that environment matters as well. It's not just about the individual and their preparation and their expectations and their adaptability, but actually there's something about having a supportive social environment around you to help you through that transition. And finally, Kevin Wilson-Smith um, talked about academic kindness. So he looked at both students and staff and measured academic kindness on a scale. Um, and found that actually the more kind students and staff are to each other, the easier it is to cope with stresses and strains and, and to have good well-being through transitions as you move jobs and things. And there was a real disparity between students' views of kindness and staff's views of kindness. So students saw kindness as the thing that we should all have, whereas staff tended to talk about needing to be competitive in order to get promotion, having to look out for yourself a little bit and look after your own interests um, and ambitions. So there's a real sort of contrast there between students and staff. But the message that we took from this is this idea of social support as a buffer. So whether you're making the transition as an academic into a new workplace or as a 18 year old or 17 year old into university, kindness, and social support, friendship, are the things that really matter for, for any kind of transition. So really drawing on Bronson Brenner's idea again of the individual within a social environment. Another way of thinking about transitions is to think about transitions as transformative experiences. So um, Mayer and Land, 
did some really quite pioneering work in education on threshold concepts. They talk about transition as being a crossing a threshold. So in the top right there, you've got a picture of a door. You're in a darkened room and you're looking through to the light on the other side. You don't know what's going to be on the other side of that door. So I just stood on the threshold, trying to make your transition, finding your way through, struggling with difficult concepts, which might be how to live life at university or might be how to cope with a higher, higher level of academic um, content and material. How do I make sense of a journal article when I'm used to reading a, an A-level textbook, for example? That's a difficult time. It's difficult concepts. It's troubling. It's, it's challenging. But as you step over the threshold, as you gain that knowledge, you are transformed. It's a period of liminality and of transformation. And as you emerge into the light, you are different. You have to go through that process in order to become the new thing. You have to be the, the uh, butterfly emerging from the chrysalis. You can't stay the caterpillar all the time, but that could be a difficult time. And F. Austin, Biester and Hughes talk about transitions leading to profound change and being an impetus for new learning, or they can be unsettling, difficult and unproductive. While certain transitions are unsettling and difficult for some people, risk, challenge and even difficulty might also be important factors in successful transitions for others. And there's something in this, this idea of transi transition through liminal spaces, transition as transformative, but that sort of throws this idea of transition to university into a different light. So we are, we are learning and learning is hard. I remember learning for the first time about how action potentials and neurotransmitters worked in a synapse. And I remember I was, I think I was in my second year at university studying joint honours biology and psychology. And this was in both of my subjects and I'd got to get my head around it. And I just didn't get it. I got an E in my chemistry A level. I really wasn't well equipped for this. And I struggled and I struggled and I struggled. And I must have read 20 textbooks on the topic and nothing would, would click. I just couldn't get my head around calcium ions and potassium ions and sodium ions. And then one day I was sat in the bath reading a textbook as you do. And it was a different textbook and I read it and it made sense. And I got out of the bath and I went and mapped it all out and drew it and did all sorts of things to try and consolidate that understanding. And the confidence that I got from cracking that, from getting that difficult concept and understanding it was amazing. And I then went on to do a PhD in neuroscience. You know, I really got it. I really understood it. And the reward from coming through the dark room and out into the light across the threshold was massive. So there's something about a sort of almost a rite of passage that you have to do this hard stuff in order to get the rewards on the other side of the threshold. So transition might be something that we all have to do in order to become something better, to transform and have new opportunities available to us. And maybe that it's not something to be frightened of, but something to look forward to, that we're going to have a struggle, but then we're going to be improved and transformed on the other side. When we think about transitions, often we think about students who might find transition more difficult. And there's often a kind of discussion in universities about the fact that students from low socioeconomic status backgrounds, students from minority backgrounds, ethnic, different ethnic groups, um, students who are first in family might find transitions harder. They don't have the same level of preparation as perhaps a middle-class student from a private school who's had personal tutoring all through their school life. You know, it's going to be different. So it's going to be difficult for those students. We problematize it particularly for those groups. But actually, Naomi and I, when we wrote the, the Ducks and Fish chapter, talked about the fact that knowledge about university might be missing for those students. They might not have been told how their brother or their mother or whoever, their cousin got on at uni and what happened. But actually no students have knowledge of university. 
So some might have been told about university and they're, they're better informed in that way, but none of them have actually been and had that lived experience. And so all students are potentially at risk of having expectations that don't match the reality. And so when we think about the um, access and participation data that we're all looking at at the moment in universities and thinking about, you know, which groups of students might have a tough time, those factors can have a predictive value, but they're certainly not certainties. All students can be at risk of having a difficult transitional experience. Likewise, students from those minority groups or disadvantaged groups might have a really good experience of university because of factors that we don't know about them. Maybe their friend went to university and they have got that knowledge about. So we tend to be a little bit assumptive and I think there's a danger in that. We can miss students who are at risk or who are vulnerable because we haven't paid attention to them because we think they're okay. And we can over target certain groups of students for support when actually they don't need it. And we're basically telling them, you're going to have a difficult experience and maybe setting up a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think we need to be cautious. Students themselves recognise that they have different experiences of transition. Um, I thought I'd change that. It's Winston and Hume 2020. Um, so when we set up transitions as a, a problematized experience, it's not really helpful we're telling students to expect problems and then they're gonna look for problems or they may well be standing there and saying, you know, I'm having a really easy time of this. What's wrong with me? Why am I not struggling? Oh my goodness, there must be something terribly wrong. What am I missing? So it's not always helpful to problematize transitions. We need to be able to say to them, some students might find this difficult. Some students find it exciting. It can be transformational. It might be all of those things and that's okay. And I think the important thing is about capturing student experience rather than just working from assumptions. So Naomi and I set out to find out what students themselves could tell us about how to facilitate transition. Um, we used a survey with Likert scale responses and also some open questions. So we had a combination of quantitative and qualitative data. I'm not sure how clear this graph will be, but if you ask Carolina for the slides, you'll be able to zoom in and have a look. So the first thing we did was looked at skills. So going back to the, um, the idea that there's a skills gap for students coming into uni. And we asked them about a range of skills, note taking, um, writing essays, referencing using APA style, um, being able to um, give a presentation, all those sorts of things. And we asked them at the start of the year and at the end of the year, of their first year at uni, how confident they were about these skills. And it was quite interesting to see that some skills students got more confident about. So through the year, they got more confident about their note-taking ability they got more confident about their ability to search for sources and they were quite low in confidence on that at the very beginning of the year. But other skills, they got less confident about. And this is what I found really interesting. The things that they found more difficult included being able to maintain attention. Students thought that they'd be able to keep attention through class. But actually, the reality of lectures meant that their attention wandered more often than they expected. They also um, got worse in terms of confidence in, about giving a presentation. So the things that were really interesting here are that for some things, they've gained confidence. They weren't very confident about using referencing when they started. They thought it was going to be a really hard thing to do. Then they learned how to do it and they got more confident. But there were other things that perhaps are more about their own understanding of the world, their own self-management, their own ability to, um, to maintain good learning habits and things like that, that they realized, actually, I'm not as good at those things as I thought I was. So their confidence has decreased. So there is an expectation reality gap, but it's not always about a deficit. It's about what can I learn? 
and what can I actually do? And I thought maintaining attention was a really interesting one. Students talked about their transitions from, these were English students, so they talked about their transition from GCSE at age 16 to A-level, usually at age 18, and they rated their experience of transition, how, how comfortable they felt with that transition. Um, and there was a real correlation. So if they had a good transition, if things were straightforward from GCSE to A-level, then they tended to have a better transition from A-level to university as well. But then the open questions. How has your experience of A-level to university transition been similar to your experience of GCSE to A-level transition? And what did you learn from that earlier transition that helped you to make the transition to university? And this is where I got really interested. So there were some things that they thought were quite similar. So moving from GCSE to A-level, they felt that they'd had to do more independent learning, that the workload had increased. It was harder work, but often students made this transition with the same friendship group. So they didn't have the pressures of having to um, fit in with a new social support group. When they talked about what helped, they realized that actually having thought about their previous transitions, realizing that they'd managed it before, that it had all turned out okay, the coping strategies and the skills that they'd used to move from one step to another helped them with the transition to university as well. So when they thought about having higher levels of work, harder work, oh yeah, that happened before, I can do it again, I can step up again. So drawing on previous experience of transition, Naomi and I argue is one way to support students to deal with transition again, getting them to think about what's changing now. Is it similar to what changed before? What helped you last time? How can you do it again? Can be a really helpful thing to do. And that in fact could be more useful for students uh, and more helpful than trying to give this, this kind of homogeneous institutional perspective. So rather than the university saying, it will help if you set yourself a study timetable. It will help if you, I don't know, um, learn to use the library properly in week three, those sorts of things that can be very kind of standardized for everybody. Students reflecting for themselves on their experiences of transition is much more personalized and they can think about how they can help themselves. Student sharing stories is also really helpful. Peer mentoring is a really successful way of doing this. And there's a lot in the literature on successful peer mentoring, but narrative testimonials also have a lot of um, power and students can choose testimonials from students who are like them, but not necessarily in those demographic terms that we tend to think about where we, you know, here's another black student, see how they got on, but on their own terms. Who's another student who struggled with the idea of making friends? Who's another student who found big group teaching really difficult? Let me find that person. So being able to pull out the issues that they're having rather than being sort of grouped with somebody that somebody, somebody that someone else way up in a university that didn't know them decided might be a suitable uh, person for them to learn from. And so Naomi and I really sort of came to the conclusion that some students do have a fish out of water experience and we can't ignore that. Um, but some have a duck to water experience and we can't ignore that either. It's just as important. We need to focus more on some longitudinal research because actually some of these transitions happen between first and second year, second and third and third and fourth year as well. Um, often students struggle in second year because they don't expect that the work will get harder again. And then again in third year. So they're still working on, you know, I did all right in first year. This is what I did. And now my marks have gone down. What happened? It's very demotivating. So we need to think about transitions through university, the different stages. Something that can be really helpful is thinking about students as partners in this context. So can we get students to facilitate transitions themselves, acting as mentors to other students, 
as storytellers, but also as researchers to really tell us, you know, the insight of the lived experience of these students. I still think that we need to think about collaboration across sectors. So thinking about managing those expectations for both tutors and students. So if the highest teachers don't know what universities like these days, then maybe we need to spend some time working with them and helping them to talk to their students about what to expect. But thinking about transition as a continuing process, something that we all go through, something that happens to every single one of us, you know, as we get promoted, as we move to another job, as we move from a PhD to an academic job or from an undergraduate to postgraduate course. And really thinking about how we build this sense of social identity, a positive social identity, how we can support students to find themselves in our universities and to find social support within that at a systemic level. Some of you know perhaps my work on psychological literacy, um, which is about the ability to intentionally apply psychology to personal, professional and societal goals. Um, there's a book chapter there that I can send to you if you want it, looking at how we can really sort of build social support through using group work early in the degree program, but also providing students with things that are relevant to their everyday lives that can really help them to engage regardless of their different backgrounds and their different experiences and learning. So particularly when they lack a prior, prior knowledge of a subject, talking about something like, I don't know, marketing a product or um, building their own sort of sense of development or their own social identity can be really helpful because it's something that they can all talk about. I also think that we need to be thinking much more about diversity. And I know I'm preaching to the converted where Emily's concerned here. I'm sure there's others of you as well. So each student enters university with a specific and complex profile, which entails specific adaptation to the academic world. They have their own journey to make. We can't do it for them, but we can certainly facilitate on an individual level. And Behrman and Malloy have this, this fantastic idea, which has been a little bit controversial, so I hope you'll forgive me, um, this, this idea of intellectual streaking. So being honest with our students about who we are. So telling that story of turning up at Kiel on my very first day, wearing my slippy shoes and falling over and not knowing what to wear. I actually have told them about that. Um, I have students in the psychology and education um, module and really, by being ourselves, by being authentic, I'm not suggesting that we tell them every detail of our personal lives, we need to have our boundaries, but being open and transparent and honest about who we are and where we fit in the world. So I've said that I come from a working class background. Students can't see that in me. You know, my speech has changed. I now sound and look like any other middle class white woman. They don't know where I've come from. So sharing some things about my story and what, what I've done can actually help them to see me as a real human being. And that can help them to identify with me and with my colleagues and with each other so that we can deal with the real need, not the needs that we might assume that they have. So that's me. Um, and I've definitely talked for more than long enough. So I'm gonna open up the floor for questions and discussions. And I've just put some notes on a slide, but I don't necessarily want to, to stick to that. So if you've got things that you've you've thought of, then feel free. So thank you, everyone. So, you know, first of all, thank you for this uh, fantastic talk. Uh, super interesting and super interesting data as well that you presented today. Um, I think we have one um, question in the chat at the moment. I don't know if you want to just unshare your screen for now so that we can. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we have one uh, question in the chat here um, asking about a paper that you, um, I think, mentioned, um, the um, also ethnographic paper by Charlotte Sounds Wonderful. Where can I access it? Um, she never published it. So I wrote up her thoughts on that. So it's I will put the reference in the chat for you. Um, it is a paper in psychology teaching review. Mm -hmm. 
give me two seconds. Oh, you can ask the next question while I find it, perhaps. You can also, you don't have to put it in the chat now. I can also put it in the actual post that I do um, mm -hmm. of the Thai network. Um, it's fine. Um, okay. Any other question? Uh, Emily. Um, so I'm very much on board with the idea of, you know, transitions, like some of it is just a learning process and you don't want to take away, you know, those kind of critical moments and stuff. I suppose, mm -hmm. how do you feel about um, like, so for example, the cohort that will be tr transitioning into university in September are going to be a very different cohort than any we've ever experienced before. And I suppose I'd be interested to hear your thoughts about where that line is about, you know, there's some things that we, we let them just figure it out on their own. Do we want to do that with this year's cohort? Because they're going to be potentially feeling more nervous and, you know, there's all that extra anxiety. So, yeah. A really good question. I think this year's cohort and even to some extent last year's cohort are, are unusual. They've had a very different experience of, of education pre-university. Pre I think my key kind of message is to listen to the students. So really to sort of check in with them, have places that they can contact you anonymously. So have like a, a a feedback form that they can fill in where they can just say, you know, I'm really worried about this or this isn't working, um, looking for themes, but also, you know, kind of one thing that I found really helpful when I've had sort of perplexing issues with students where perhaps something's going wrong and I don't quite know what it is, is to run student focus groups, but to have students facilitating those focus groups because students are more open in talking to other students about what's going on. So if you can kind of, encourage some students to, to just run some discussion groups. You know, if we're back without social distancing, then provide pizza or something and just say, you know, come along and have a chat and get them to feed back to you so that their, their anonymity is protected, but you get really honest views from them. A little bit different than using student voice reps because they, they tend to report through formal channels. And for me, this is more about a kind of spot focus on what's going on right now. How, how are things feeling? You know, where do you need the extra help? And I think perhaps, as you say, you know, things might be quite different this year. So having that response from students is, is really useful. I also just wander the corridors sometimes and stop random students. And say, How's it going? Talk to me. Does that answer your question, Emily? Uh, yeah, no, uh, um, yes, we, we have the... Um feedback forms the the anonymous things which have been really really helpful this year i think i just have extra worries and, and stuff about so no it's a, um good ideas for like focus groups and stuff so thanks thank you we have a question in the chat here um what are the most effective ways to get students involved in supporting new students um, transitions sorry i'm going to read that where are we I can I can actually expand on that. Sorry, um, can you just yes, on. please. Yeah, just because this has all been very interesting because it's it's kind of an area that I'm trying to focus on right now. And it's more you actually kind of touched on it a wee bit during the presentation and it's it's the pre-entry kind of side of things. I suppose it's it's the lived experiences that actually can be more beneficial than kind of yeah, we're gonna have this webinar or we're gonna have this really kind of formal. It's just someone being able to see of like there's someone who had the exact same experience as me, couldn't work out how all this stuff worked, but has mm -hmm. seemingly managed to succeed. But I think the area that's, I think, difficult to try and get kind of current students involved is not all of them want to talk about their, their experiences. And, you know, sometimes for good reason. Yeah. And I think sometimes it, I think when it comes from an institutional level, like, as you know, it's a university asking you to do this. I think there's some kind of hesitancy as well, really, um, from students about not really wanting to kind of show that they kind of struggled, but also also feel, I think, a lot of the times, like, why am I doing stuff for the university for free? <laughs> mm -hmm. so, yes. Um, but kind of just, I'm kind of conscious as well, kind of, I'm, I'm trying currently fighting that kind of battle right now of just like like trying to kind of get students involved but I don't know maybe it's the old cynicism 
in my own experiences that make go, yeah, but no. <laughs> no, no I don't think so. I, I think there's there's a really careful balance to strike in working with students because often we can see them as a source of free labour and they tend to be, you know, the same students will always volunteer. So I have particular memories of a, a, student, a mature student with autism who was desperate to help all the other students so much that she completely overwhelmed herself with student support activities and outreach activities. And it was all very well-meaning and we hadn't really realized how much she was volunteering for because she was doing stuff with the school, with individual academics, with the wider university. Yeah, and, and there's a real risk of taking advantage of those students and then of the students who are kind of more reluctant to engage, you know, that, that they, or they just can't because, you know, they've got work and they've got kids and they, you know, I didn't get involved in, in extracurricular stuff at uni because I just couldn't. I'd got a three month old baby when I started, you know, that was where my time was going. I think it is a, a really careful balance. I think one thing is to always find ways to acknowledge it. So, for example, volunteering credit, if, if you have that. Um, can be a good way of, of giving the students something else to, to put on their CV that, that's formally accredited. Um, that, you know, and making things as easy as possible. So can you write us, you know, a 2000 word essay on your experience of transition? Well, no, you're probably not, not going to get very many. Can you write 100 words on a Google form about, you know, one piece of advice that you'd give to students like you coming to the university? might be a different gig, you know, can you fit it into your course somewhere? So I talk about transitions on my psychology and education module quite a lot. And I get them to talk to me there, you know, are there ways to capture that and to give assessment credit for it, for example? Um, as I say, I think partly as well, making it um, a social experience. So, you know, I'm a big fan of getting free pizza and cakes and things into a room and just saying, right, everybody just sit down and, and chat, get to know each other. And you know, I might throw the odd question in every now and then, see what you can do with it. Um, you know, that, that can be a really helpful way to go. But I think it's about not creating big projects that are daunting and scary and trying to just give a kind of opportunity for people to do things if and when they can. And you can gather resources over a number of years. They don't all have to be in place at the end of this year on a perfect website that looks beautiful with video recordings of every student with you know, appropriate diversity in, in every sample, you know, it's, it's not going to happen. But I think just, you know, trying to build it and getting the students to help you to do it, to engage thank their you, friends. Thank you so much. That's, that's very helpful. I mean, it's a bit of an uphill struggle, particularly, I think, with more vulnerable groups, because I think the phrase I've come to hate the most is like, well, every, they're all adults. And it's just like, well, there's different, different levels of experience and yeah. It can be a very kind of belittling experience to just go, all right, well, they're they're all adults and they should all just somehow know this through osmosis. Um, yeah, shut just up and get up. on with it thinking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They are all adults, but, you know, I can look around at my colleagues and my friends and my family members and I can see adults who are, you know, have been an adult for many, many years, including myself probably, who don't always have every bit of information that they should have or or you know, the experience to deal with a new situation. We all meet new experiences in life. And, you know, if going to uni is a, a, a difficult one for you, then, you know, being an adult isn't really going to help you. So, yeah, it, it's, it's like I said about snowflakes, they only melt when it's warm. What are the pressures that we're putting on them? And how can we help to chill the environment a little bit? Um, so there's another question here, and I, I really love this question by Karen, because it is basically at the heart of what the Tile Network does and wants to ignite and wants to motivate. Uh, so she asks, um, would it be helpful to have more formalized links between schools and universities? So as a former support for learning worker, I would help, um, I would help pupils to transition from primary to secondary schools visits and visiting staff. Absolutely. And there is quite a bit of this happening in some universities now where universities will go and give talks in schools and colleges. Um, you know, students will come and do um, taster days or visit days to the uni. There is a little bit of a problem 
because there can be a perception from universities that they're doing this to recruit students. And so they go into schools and colleges and all the schools and colleges see are um, a sales pitch to get their students to come. They don't see it as being particularly helpful to, to their students to have some university tutor turn up and go, come to Kiel, it's really amazing. It's the best university in the world. Um, and also fitting that in around the curriculum is really difficult. And they don't know that students are going to go to that university. So preparing them for you know, what they should expect at Kiel isn't always particularly helpful if they're going to go to Glasgow. Um, schools and colleges tend to find it more helpful if universities are willing to share resources. So can they come and um, bring their students for half a day to spend some time in a lab and do an experiment of some sort? Can they access some primary literature, can they draw on research expertise? So if I've got to teach statistics tomorrow and I'm not used to teaching statistics and I need a bit of help, can I ring up a colleague at the university to get a little bit of input on that? So we've got to, as university staff, I think, be sensitive to the fact that these people are professional teachers. Um, you know, they have a job to do and we shouldn't just be sort of expecting that we can do them favours, but we need to be working in partnership and working out what they need from us, as well as what we need from them. It's not just about getting more bums on seats, which can be the temptation, I think. But yeah, there are some really successful um, library visit days was a particularly good one. Getting students to engage with primary material. Okay, thank you. You've got Yvonne Skipper in the audience here as well. Yvonne's over in your education department and she's got some brilliant experience of doing <laughs> outreach events that are really helpful with, uh, for students that students and teachers have really enjoyed. So have a chat with Yvonne. Um, any other question or comments? Um, on that note with, with outreach actually, um, in psychology we also have, um, for example, I offer a service learning course where um, university students go to local schools and teach pupils on how to study. And so they see firsthand what university students look like and they, they come in all kinds of shapes and forms and so on. And this also has been helpful. So um, schools have reported back that um, it has been a helpful experience for the pupils to actually um, eye-opening really seeing this is what university students actually look like and what they do. Um, yeah, any other I think our students are some of our best advocates. So getting final year project students to go and, and you know, do some data collection in schools, mm. but talk to the students there about what they're doing and why they're doing it and what it's like to be at uni. It's much more natural and authentic. Yeah. Charlotte? Um, yeah, I had a question. Um, it was what you were saying regarding sort of problematizing transition for some groups and how that can be sort of dangerous in terms of sort of living up to a self and fulfilling prophecy and how to support um, those children who may additionally need it, but sort of the dangers in identifying them before that really. So when thinking sort of about universal and targeted approaches and how we'd really identify those children if you don't want to sort of assume one group might be more vulnerable. I think, I mean, I think there's a difference here. I know you do work in transitions in school, Charlotte, and I think there is a difference here um, without wanting to um, sound like somebody who might have um, said, you know, they're all adults, they should just get on with it. They are adults, and I think there is a difference there. And I think there's a difference between um, targeting in an assuming way and making available to all making it clear that there are opportunities for support and making that support universally available, allowing students to select. But I think as well at uni, this goes alongside all the other things that we do around engagement monitoring. And, you know, I think if we have a student who is underachieving, who's failing something, you know, we need to be in touch with that student and say, you know, is everything all right? What can we do? We tend to get in touch, don't we, to tell them off. You haven't been coming to your lab classes, you naughty, naughty student. And that disengages them and it, it disenfranchises them. Whereas getting in touch and saying, I haven't seen you for a little while, are you okay? You know, I, I once um, emailed all my students who'd got a 100% attendance record and said, congratulations, well done and thank you. And you know, can you, any feedback that you've got, you're the ones who are attending all the time. And they were totally blown away because they only ever heard from us when they'd done something wrong. So I think it's about creating that that supportive environment that says, 
we're here, we're on your side, we want you to do well. You know, we're not just here to shout at you when you do badly and then leave you to it when you're not. I think that's what it's about, making that support available and making sure that it's signposted and, and explicit. Yeah, thank you for that. I suppose I was really coming from it from sort of a school perspective, because I suppose it's more important really to identify children sort of when they're a bit younger when sort of thinking about primary, secondary school transition. But I suppose signposting would also be useful when thinking about sort of earlier school transitions and um, like giving children that ownership really and thinking, OK, if you need some more support, this is this is what we've got available. So I suppose mm -hmm. there's lessons um, learned. Yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> We, we, we tend to kind of assume that people are okay unless we see that they're not, don't we? And I think sometimes being very sort of just, just being open and encouraging. And also we say to students, you know, you're responsible for yourself now. You know, you need to take responsibility for your own learning. Well, giving them opportunities to do that and to, to speak up and feel safe when they do so, I think is an important part of empowering that independent learning that we're looking for. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thank you. Thank you for a great talk too. Thank you, Charlotte. Okay. Um, any other questions? If not, I'm going to uh, say thank you again, uh, Julie, for, for your talk. Um, again, we will have all the material on our Child Network uh, website and uh, was a recording and everything. And um, all right. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop the recording now. I just want to say thank you to everyone yeah. for, for coming and being such an engaged audience. So thank you.